historical precedent. This is what you will hear more and more, the smooth holy act. Could this happen again, as happened in the 1930s? And then we had a situation where uh, a lot of people thought it couldn't happen. It, one, two thousand economists, I think, brought to the president saying that this can happen, and yet it did. I don't think that, unfortunately or fortunately, there are any serious obstacles to creating such an act. If you look at the voting behavior, a lot of Democrats have been concerned about this. If you look very carefully, the agenda of Bernie Sanders, who was the opposition candidate among the Democrats, he had actually similar uh, emphasis in certain areas. Uh, not to that kind of protectionism that we hear from the Trump administration, but to emphasize the role of the US economy, our personal interests, reduce our international security arrangements, and, and so on and so forth. Now, when this happened, one of the first retaliations that happened was by Canada, which was a great surprise at the time because Canada was considered to be the most loyal trade partner, but they didn't have a choice. Now you have a situation where, in just a matter of two or three weeks, a lot of people in Mexico have, um, because I think they really believe that this wouldn't happen nonetheless, they have this theory what I call the sober realism, that when Trump comes into the office, he will talk tough, but he just wants to have better arrangements with Mexico. No, he wants more. He uh, is a, trans a transformational president. Whether he can achieve the transformation or not, and will it be something that most of the world would like to see, that's a different story. But how would this then, uh, what you just envisioned, how might this... Uh if you look at how this would proceed, the kind of movement that you mentioned and, and how, what Congress might do about it, I think that there are several ways to talk about it. One is that we could look at the U.S. manufacturing, what is its role, what Mr. Trump wants, and what is unlikely to happen. But the most immediate way to look at it is to look at the deficits. What this administration is doing clearly, it is looking at those countries that the U.S. has the greatest trade deficits with. That means China, European Union, if it was a country here as a region, as a theoretical entity, but then Germany, Japan, Mexico, and Canada, the five big ones. Um, it gets actually very intriguing. Here you have those countries and the deficit in the years and years. But since I believe only in, in the economy based on individuals in the end, that means GDP per capita. If you look at those deficit numbers and you calculate what are they relative to the uh, economy and population, particularly the population, it's pretty interesting. If that were the case, then the US probably should start a trade war with Ireland or maybe Singapore because per capita basis, they are the greatest uh, deficit contributors. Uh, and China and India are actually in the very end of the list, even Mexico. What is so badly understood in the U.S., I believe, that the trade deficit has been there more than four decades. Now, I understand that a lot of people are concerned about China, but then let's be real. When I was in New York, a lot of people came there. A lot of people were very concerned about Japan. Uh, and thereafter, they were concerned about Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and, and South Korea. This is a regional deficit with global implications. The United States has simply had a trade deficit for more than 40 years. And it has happened, had it mainly with emerging Asia, what currently was emerging Asia. Um, the initiative that you mentioned would never have been taken seriously under the Clinton administration, I think. They are being taken seriously now. Tea Party, which is a minor, has a minor role among Republicans, very vocal, but minor, is strongly for this. Marco Rubio, who was one of the presidential candidates, has been associated with the Tea Party, is strongly for this as well. He would also like to reverse all the developments with Cuba for other reasons. Um, midstream or mainstream Republicans, Mitch McConnell and others, would probably prefer to have alternative solutions, but if it becomes a very tough political struggle, they might go with this. Yesterday, Mitch McConnell gave a statement as a Senate, one of the Senate leaders, where he said that so far what he has seen the Trump administration do is all positive. That includes the initiatives mentioned. Now, what about the companies themselves? I think it's fair to say that across the board, all the major technology giants in the US, from Google to Microsoft and the rest, are seriously 
concern about the visa status or the, the role of immigrants. Now, if you look at the history of Silicon Valley, I did a study for the European Commission on why is it that even though Europeans had the same technological knowledge in the late 90s and had some venture capital, how is it that Americans reap the benefits from the internet, which actually was first introduced in Europe? And the conclusion was obvious, I think, in the end. Europeans had the same technology knowledge. They had the same science basis. But when you look at the venture capital, Americans took the risks. Europeans always uh, were on the side of caution. They were far more conservative. They, did, they, they wouldn't take the risks. They didn't want to be penalized. Uh, they didn't like bankruptcies. Americans didn't like either, but they wanted to do that as a price for getting into the market. Uh, so Americans had been good in these things, but one thing that was really central in my study was that it would not have happened without immigration. It would not have happened without the Chinese networks in Silicon Valley, Taiwanese networks in the Silicon Valley, and so many other Asians uh, who have been active in the Valley, not just in technology, but in the business services over there. And the best studies, I'm thinking Saxenian and a few others that I've seen on Silicon Valley, make it very clear, without the role of immigrants, it would be impossible. Secondly, if you take the role of immigration away, the productivity growth in the U.S., the economic growth, will absolutely start starting relatively soon when that impact is being felt. America is not what it is today without immigration. It is immigration that is making it dynamic. Europe hasn't had that. Shame on Europeans for that one. Uh, here I'm a contrarian. I feel that if Europe will open more doors, but carefully, more carefully those doors. Uh, in the future, perhaps they wouldn't have to pay more to the immigrants, and I think how they have to. They're aging very fast. So you have a real issue with BPOs. Now, these are the negatives from that point of view. But then there are some positives. Mr. Duterte seems to have a very personal relationship with Mr. Trump. He thinks, at least, that he has. Um, <coughs> politics, nothing lasts forever. But it's a better basis for a relationship than the administration had with the Obama administration. That has to be clear. And it matters, I think, to Trump administration. It also matters what kind of representative Philippines has sent to the US. Uh, that has a certain meaning that uh, Philippines is trying to look beyond the Obama era, if you will. I think Trump administration appreciates that. So there are certain strategic benefits to this. I think also that Mr. Trump, unlike Mr. Obama, is not so eager to maintain bases unless the countries where they are pay more. And if they can't pay or if they don't want to pay, he is not so much against the idea that they leave. Uh, they're there for the pay. Why can pay? So the strategic approach is also different. But there are certain unknowns in all of these equations, and that is that how far the technology companies would go to push the administration to a corner. Can they do anything in that regard? I don't think they can. They have already made clear what they think about uh, technology situation, what they think about the role of immigrants in IPOs and technology capabilities, and how important these visas are for knowledge base. Let's be real. Late 90s, when I met some of the Intel CEOs and we were talking about these things, the then chairman and CEO said that, you know, before the interview, he came from his uh, daughter's PhD dissertation. He said, you know, it was very instructive, but there was nothing that there that differed from Intel's uh, personal. He said that there were like five people who were getting their PhDs, and out of those people, maybe 80% were immigrants. Most of them didn't have a green card yet. They would have great prospects in the US, and many of them probably chose to stay. But you ask yourself, why, uh, why this kind of, um, why would you hurt yourself this way, your own growth in the long run? But this is part of what this administration is and what it believes in. There's also another way to look at it. I mean, the discussion that we have is about protectionism, and we talk about trade. But trade is not all there is. What about U.S. foreign direct investment? I mean, if you decide to be a protectionist in the trade, it doesn't mean that you're going to be also a protectionist in investment and migration, as in, in this case. And if you look at the foreign direct investment, FDI, as you can see, 
the Europe share is three times that of Canada, Singapore, Australia, Japan, Mexico, China, and Korea all together. These advanced economies have done business with themselves, among themselves, between themselves, through the post-war era. So you have to ask yourself, would they go further than in this regard? How far would you like to go? Is the idea to make U.S. more attractive uh, destination for FDI for foreign countries? That's hard for a country like the Philippines. That's hard for many emerging economies. You don't have the money to create a base there. Most European friends that I have, senior executives, constantly complain about the expenses in the U.S. And oftentimes, honestly, they're quite right about it. So, will this be included as well then? How far will it go? And let's be real, if you start America first, where do you end? I mean, there would be China first. What would that be? Imagine. There should be Germany first. That was a common way of thinking, 1930s. Uh, there could be Japan first. There were some people in the early 90s, even Akio Morita, the famous senior executive of Sony, who aligned themselves with the radical right at one point. Japan can't say no. Uh, they were holding these views, at least momentarily. There could be a Korea first. Now, if they would do the same as Americans do, and let's say there would be a real retaliation, then I would have to think about China would start a trade war against Taiwan, South Korea, Switzerland, Australia, and Germany. And the Germans will immediately start fighting the, Nerd, the Dutch, Belgium, Czechs, Vietnam, and Ireland. Japan will go full force against China, Australia, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, and so on and so forth. And to make it more interesting, what about Philippines? Should there be a Philippine first also? And would it mean then that the Philippines would start a trade war against China, Taiwan, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia? I mean, you can't do this. And it happened with smooth quality. Um, did it help with the U.S. unemployment? No, it made it worse. It contributed to it. Uh, it was about 25%, I think, in mid-30s, up to 37. Then there was a brief moment when it seemed to lessen to 15% or so. But they started tightening too early. Again, unemployment went up. There was one great Keynesian operation that did save unemployment in the U.S. for employment. And that was World War II. That created jobs, but at a cost, at a terrible cost. So when the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, who is known for being conservative, cautious, at least in public, when he said the other day that, uh, sent a reminder to Washington that it would be good to remember the lessons of World War II, I was taken back. I think that we are now in a rhetorical territory that uh, allows things that would have been unheard of uh, a couple of years back. And there are many Chinese politicians who are extremely concerned about uh, these sort of things. They would never start a trade war against Taiwan, South Korea, or Switzerland. They would minimize perhaps tourism to Taiwan. Right now they might buy less, but they don't want to separate. They want to interconnect. That's the whole idea of this war, the old one road, one belt. Interconnect, create connections, unite. And, but unite with the difference, accepting the idea that we are different and that we have a right to be different. That's where the notion of uh, non-intervention comes into play. They want to do business and they want to gain from that business, but not at the cost of war. They know what it means. And not at the cost of humiliation, colonial humiliation. They have one century for it. Or they, they don't want to go there. And I think that this lack of uh, sense of history and understanding that one man's nationalism is the other one's uh, chauvinism is forgotten. We've forgotten the lessons of the Second World War. If my father, who fought five years in wars, and whose only wish for his two kids, sons, was that never another war. Uh, it's amazing how lightly people make certain comments. So this was a winding answer, but I wanted to show that we talk about trade protectionism, but uh, it's not the only area. It's also the investment and how will this play out matters in terms of how, what kind of scenarios we have for the trade. And those two, trade and investment, matter what kind of scenarios we have for migration and BPOs. Uh, I would think that it would be extremely short-sighted 
to do with that uh, against and, and how that would hit uh, Filipino BPOs. But I would also think that uh, I've been urging my friends who are waiting for the longest time to invest more in Philippines. I think they've been making a mistake by not being more proactive, but perhaps they have been concerned about the, the regional aspects and political aspects until now. Uh, there are other things that countries can do, but I think this is part of this big shift from US-led globalization to Chinese-led globalization. Right now it looks black and white. I think ultimately, hopefully, it will stabilize and we see both playing a certain role in this. But I wouldn't be surprised if this kind of law would go through in Congress. They are now, uh, it's viable. When you have a Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican White House, you can do a lot of things some of the time. But I think that the next this first six months until uh, May, June, when we will know about what happens to NAFTA, that's the big milestone. And then we can perhaps, in light of this, we can assess whether and how far 